All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Conjure Community. I'm Adam Grace. I'm here with uh, Alex Slimmer, Steve Barcelona from Conjure Community, the world's best magic club. Today, we are going to look at right. the magic of Simon Drake. And uh, you may be saying, who is Simon Drake? Well, you need to know who this is. Simon Drake is a very important person to magic, especially if you live over in the UK. So do us a favor, hit like, subscribe to this channel, so you'll be notified when we go live with these videos every single time. So I'll pose the question to the team here. Who is Simon Drake? Hmm? Well, I'm going to stick my neck out and say he's a magician. <laughs> Good call. Good call. <laughs> I don't know. No he's definitely, he's definitely a magician. Forward. Definitely a magician. Simon Drake is a television magician from the UK. And Simon had a, a slant on his magic that was definitely more gothic for sure. Uh, opportunity for blood and guts and uh, demons. And, you know, I, I think the, the best line that I heard about it was David Copperfield put it pretty, pretty succinctly. He said, Simon Drake is like what I am in the United States, but from hell. <laughs> right. So he's, he's doing very, very evil slant uh versions of classical magic it's very classical magic you'll see when we look at some of these examples here it's all very classical stuff but he's definitely made it into something different with his his point of view with his artistic point of view that he sort of puts on all these things and the backgrounds and the theater that he's in this thing is from a show that's called the secret cabaret and he had a a secret theater in London, or, or that's the way they, they, they uh, sort of present it. He had a theater in London and he presented all these tricks that we're gonna see in this theater show. But in addition to that, there's all kinds of little vignettes in between little automatons, but all the automatons that you see in the show, they're all like evil automatons. So there's all kinds of weird stuff that's going on. But what I've pulled out here is basically all the, all the best classical like magic uh, that, that basically we would care about, right? So that we could just see this guy's point of view and just see, how a guy with this point of view would handle and give a treatment to these, these classical pieces of magic and make them look in this way. So it's a, uh, I think for us, it's very educational just to see a different artist do something completely different than probably what most of us would do with these, these pieces of magic. So uh, take it away, Adam. Yeah, let's do, let's just, well, you'll get a great idea of who Simon Drake is. We'll tell you more about him in a second because he is a pretty phenomenal uh, performer, but let's just watch this first bit here because this will tell you a lot about who Simon Drake is. All right, so I got this new monitor. So let me know if the, if the sound and stuff is working because you know how I roll sometimes. Let's see, let me know. All right, here we go. Sounds good. Ha, <laughs> 
<laughs> no resolution, no, right? I'm no just leaving it hanging there. <laughs> no yeah. restoration necessary at all. Yeah, we don't ever really look at this kind of thing. You know, this is like good old fashioned box jumper magic, you know, like the big boxes. Some of it, some of it is. Yeah. Some of it is not. Some and, of it is closer to, to what we got. But the, the box jumper stuff that he does is like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, like that's every like, single one of them. That's like a perfectly straightforward presentation of the sawing in half, except you just end it, <laughs> you know? And so that's the, that's the interesting twist on it. I thought it was fascinating. It's fascinating, but you know, if you look at it, if that was just an isolated piece by itself, he just murdered that woman, right? <laughs> yeah, that is literally what just happened. Yeah. You actually do not actually need any gaffes to do that effect right. as done just then. <laughs> no well, method necessary. <laughs> and I mean, like, I think we talked about this before. This is like pretty much the Ricciardi uh, take on it, right? Because he does the buzzsaw illusion. He cuts them in blood and guts everywhere and they leave her that way through intermission. He's Simon Drake is definitely influenced by Ricciardi. I would think so. I would think so. Yeah. And when you look at Simon's sort of performing career, you see that, you know, he had a big theater background, which is apparent when you watch Simon's work. Uh, But, you you know, what's what's fascinating about Simon is that he went on to to not just do magic and have a very prolific career in that, but he went on to be a consultant for so, oh, so many projects in the UK. And I just pulled up a list of, of some of the stars that he worked with along the way. Elton John, Phil Collins, David Gilmore, Meat Loaf, Steve Miller's Abracadabra. I don't even know what that is. George Harrison, Julian Lennon, Kate Bush, Peter Gabriel, Katy Perry. So these are people that he's all worked with or he's worked as a consultant on. And oh, uh, nobody big. And, and think about yeah. think about the arena <laughs> rock shows and, you know, the big yeah. concerts, excuse me, that were happening in the 80s. A lot of them had magic elements, even into the 2000s. There were a lot of magic elements that a, oh, lot, yeah. of, a lot of these pop stars use, you know? Yeah. And Alice, Cooper, Alice Cooper's famous yeah. for that stuff, right? He's got yeah. all throughout the whole show. So there's, you know, a guy like Simon Drake, if he finds the right star, he's, he's got consulting money paying for his year, right? It's pretty good. Well, it is Halloween, and we wanted to, we wanted to bring you somebody fresh that you had maybe not ever seen before that... And we were really lucky because Alex was able to tie it into like this Halloween timed theme. And it's funny because uh, talking about, you know, Halloween and like this sort of how everybody loves the uh, gorier type arts around Halloween. You know, they call it the spooky season. I think I heard that a million times. Um, you know, like uh, they did a they did a production of uh, of Dr. Faustus in South London. And he was a, a magic consultant on that stage presentation mm-hmm. as well. So. Um, you know, you're talking about a guy who's had his, you know, hands in every performing art there is, but magic has always been his, you know, first love that he's come back to. So you said earlier about the box jumper stuff, right? So this is, this is really an example of the opposite of that because, you know, he is a stage performer and whatnot, but this is not, you know, this is not a big time illusion. This is something that is, uh, is, is gonna, you know, seem familiar, but not familiar at the same time. So let's check. And and more intimate. (laughs) What did you want to say something else? I said, and just a little bit more intimate. Yes.
He's like, here, take the clock. He's like, no, not yet. I got to do this again. <laughs> Wasn't even red. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wasn't even red. My arm was always red when I did that trick. Um, he, he's probably doing it a lot more. His arm got used to doing it. He's probably doing it a few times a week, you know, or a few yeah. times a night. <laughs> yeah, Boy, it's a good trick, man. It's a strong, strong illusion. It's interesting. Yeah, it's just the whole take on it is completely different. Yeah, it is. It is. It's it's funny how he he uh, he it's not too it's not too hard to like to to know where to stop with that trick and Simon's like I'm gonna I'm gonna take it just a little bit further like you know yeah I think it's it's it is reminiscent of uh, you know I kind of see maybe where Chris Angel got a little of his influence I didn't realize it until now certainly mm -hmm. or or Dan Sperry like most of them looking at that like. You know, it, it came from somewhere, and I think it probably came from here. Well, if you look at how Simon sort of carries himself in more of these, like the first one, he was sort of dressed like in a tuxedo, like a classical magician. This one, he was so, sort of more look like a like a rock star, or like a pop star of the day, right? Because this is uh, late '80s. This is like '88 or so, I think, when this was all shot. Uh, so there seems to be two characters within this whole thing, where he's got this rock star and he's got the the uh, the more classical magician. And they seem to be aspects of himself that are at, at, at war with each other throughout this whole thing. Uh, but you'll see that he's he's more like a pop star, more like what Chris Angel's trying to be throughout this whole thing. He's got the, you know, the unshaven look and he's wearing like the leather and and all that stuff. You'll see it's it's, you know, definitely, definitely an influence there. <laughs> now, what a, what about the other side, though? Because I know that there's also then you, you mentioned the classical Right, the classical side of Simon Drake, which I think we have a clip coming up next that's very much like that, right? Mm -hmm. But it's still dark. It's still dark. I mean, it's classical, but it's like it's like right before he becomes this leather clad guy. Like so he's like right there in the dark realm of dealing with all these dark issues and dark, you know, presentations. But then it's almost like he flips and just becomes totally evil and becomes this other guy. It's it's interesting. It's an interesting it, little it, through line that's going it's through. It's duality. It. It's duality. Is there a yeah. Dr. Jekyll, yeah. Mr. Hyde thing going on? Kinda. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a good observation. Yeah, totally. Totally. <laughs> they don't all actually right. have like a I haven't seen any physical change yet, but yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right, don't and the next one, I'll have something that sort of plays with that a little bit more. You'll see. It's it's really good. Don't Okay, so don't let the tuxedo fool you here. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. All right. Let's check it out. <laughs> she doesn't like it.
So that's one of those little close-up vignettes, right? He's got these little pieces that are like 30 seconds to a minute long, sometimes maybe two minutes long. And they're like classical pieces of magic that sort of are related to something that was right before it or coming next. And it's uh, it's interesting because all these little tiny close-up pieces without his face, they sort of tie the whole show together. Really neat, really a neat concept, a mm -hmm. neat idea, especially for the late 80s. You know, that was a lot of magic in a show for the late so 80s. What we're watching was a television show, right? That's correct. That's yeah. correct. He had a TV special called The Secret Cabaret. And I think now he, he basically is using that as th that is a commercial, right? That DVD is basically a commercial that he can give to corporations that want to hire someone for, you know, a holiday party. He has yeah. a mansion. He has it set up for events. And it's in an undisclosed location. You only get it if you hire him and hire his crew. And you go to this old mansion and it's got all these beautiful props that are all over the place embedded in the walls. There's fortune tellers, there's close-up magicians, right? It's like an evening out with this sort of evil slanted magic. And it's a, you know, unforgettable experience that you tell your, your grandchildren about. Pretty smart, pretty smart. He mm -hmm. seems like he's making a pretty good living, just, you know, basically chasing his bliss and doing what he loves. So mm -hmm. I admire that. That's pretty great. I like what you said too, about those little interludes. Like he's a, uh... Like I appreciate the theatricality of it. I appreciate the fact that he that he's not just presenting magic. He's thinking about themes. He's thinking about his character. He's thinking about how to tie these things together, even if they're loose ties. Like he's still thinking about that stuff. And the fact that he was thinking, I mean, think about this is this is when Copperfield was was dominating the television waves here in the United States with his very clean image. You know, mm -hmm. we had we had the anti Copperfield dominating the airwaves over in the uk it's almost like the rolling stones to the beatles right it's pretty mm -hmm. funny i hadn't thought about that till just this moment when you said that i funny. mean if you just and that's really true isn't it rolling stones to the beatles <laughs> but uh it just strikes me it's like R richie Arty before this was doing this kind of gore magic kind of not everything he did but he had certain pieces like that but previous to that i don't think they're really i think that might be the initiating point of that kind of magic well, weren't they originally when they did the original uh, Sawing a Lady in Half? Wasn't that like that was the gore thing before Ricciardi? Like they would cut a lady in yeah, half they, and the woman would be dead on stage and they'd let the audience come up and like walk around her and see that she was dead. And then they would restore her at the end. I don't know. I'm going to look into that. I've got Illustrated History of Magic. I bet you that it'll be in there. Because I remember that being a whole a whole thing. Like that was a whole segment in magic history, like maybe in yeah. the 30s or something in theater shows that were like, dueling at you know opposing theaters they would both be doing you know the uh, cutting a lady in half and the way to make people come see your cutting a lady in half is that it's real we really kill this woman <laughs> <laughs> come on down buy a ticket we're gonna kill yeah her. come down and see it you'll get to get up close and see the dead woman on stage you know it was like a whole there was a whole selling point to the thing there's something definitely more like when you watch this this kind of stage stuff there's something to this that does ring back to the 17 and 1800s where where you know you you didn't really know what was real and what wasn't i mean you had to go you had to go to the theater and watch the magician to find out and i'm sure that almost like it was real magic <laughs> yeah 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 like when i when you read the houdini biography and the biographies of like of robert houdin and stuff like that like you really get the sense that they were they were not just protecting secrets, but they were protecting the big secret, which was, is magic real? Is it connected to spiritualism? Is it connected to the devil? And all those, you know, things. And that was the big secret, really, was like, you know, is this stuff really happening? And the audiences didn't know. It really didn't, you know. Of course, you had some yeah. people that knew. But yeah, but, but that's, yeah. you know, it's like Abe Lincoln said, right? You can't fool all the people all the time. But I think that that's sort of the job of the magician is to be almost, you know, that person that's blurring the lines all the time. And the ones that are real good at it seem like they're almost like ambassadors for the mysterious, right? They're here to bring it to you and you don't know what's real, what's fake. And that line is blurred the whole time. And I think that's when the magic is, uh, that's when magic is the best, really. Hey, Steve, I wonder what it would have been like to be alive in, in in Houdini's day or Houdin's day and to go into that theater and watch and see what because you know those shows would be like three or four hours long mm -hmm. you know I so wouldn't you love to be able to go back in time and sit in and see like what yeah, that that's, atmosphere was like I think I've talked about that you know before it's like if I could go back in time I'd want to see stuff like that I'd want to go to a Houdini bridge jump yeah you know because like we can imagine what that's like 
but you imagine what it's like in the middle of winter, right? And you're freezing and they're putting him in the box and throwing him in the river. Like it's a whole visceral experience to actually. And folks at that time had a longer attention span. Like us, yeah. if we went back in time with the minds that we've cultivated with this time, oh, yeah. I don't think we'd be able to stand there that long. I don't, I think wow. we would just get bored and walk away. You know, we wouldn't be able to handle it. Not we to stayed. switch off Drake, but yeah. uh, Houdini would do the milk can escape. He would escape from the milk can and sit on top of it and wait for 45 minutes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just wait. And the music plays and the timer's gone, right? You could never do that. Here. No. Yeah, Simon Drake has a me. version of the milk can. I didn't bring it up. We can if you like, but he did a version of the milk can. And it's a similar thing, but it's television. It's the modern era. He does that, but it's like that long. Right? Yeah. Like he's sitting there for maybe 30 seconds after it's over. Like, oh, no, is he dead? And then they pull the curtain back. You go, oh, he's there. No, it's all okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this next thing is called surprise. Uh, should we should we put the warning out there for? Nah. All right. Just brace yourself. Just brace, brace yourself. yourself. All right. It's called surprise. Yeah, there's a surprise coming. I guess that's all you need to know. I love that he's standing on the side there like i wonder what's for dinner <laughs> you know what i really love about that is that if you watched any other stage performer do that the magician would have been in front of the box doing this the whole time yeah totally you know and 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 at least he has the at least he has the sense like he has the actual the theatrical sense to just step aside and be still and let the most interesting thing be the shadow because it is pretty interesting. I mean, how you know, that illusion works. Totally. That's, that's a really interesting thing right there, because if you think about it, he's not really, he's manifesting something and not really taking credit for it. You know what I mean? And, and that not music really. point, that music points right to that, right? Like that yeah. music sounds like really evil and ominous. And it's like pointing to that something <laughs> is happening and he's just sort of 
opening the door for it. I yeah, think, exactly. You're dead yeah, on with a good it. Way to put it. He's it's manifesting great. it. So cool. That is that was a really cool presentation of that. I've seen that trick a ton. Yeah. Right. And it's never interesting. Like that one you'll remember, right? Yeah. The other ones you go, oh, right. They do something interesting with the shadows. And you're like, for me, it's like, I'm as interested in it because the principle is interesting as the trick. And that, that shouldn't be the way it is. It should be like, so, whoa, that affected me I, as a piece this, of art, you know? This brought back to me as a kid uh, in the great state of New Jersey, greatest state in the nation. Uh, there was a magician. I can't think of his name, you know, darn it. I wish I could. But every Halloween for the month of October, he would host a month long series of shows at a local community theater, you know, and there, and, you know, he had a big illusion show and everything was tricked out like this type of thing, you know, and it was really a big deal. And I'm wondering if it isn't a knockoff of this, it's quite possibly could be. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, you'd you see know? something like that happen. And I know it affected me when I'm, when I'm watching. I mean, this is, it yeah, can I've inspire you. It can inspire like you if you have a bunch of tricks. <laughs> yeah. Pretty. It's, it's like, very interesting. Yeah. You know, also like, I, have we done Darren Brown? We haven't done Darren Brown yet. No, now. because it's, there's so much good stuff. I don't, you know, I mm -hmm. don't know what to pick because, you know, right. there's so much. There's yeah. So I mean, much. you can, you can, you can sit with Darren. We can sit with one episode of Darren and stuff and, and just, talk about it for for weeks or we could right? we could just talk about it for the rest of the year right and just go yeah. through stuff i mean there's so much yeah <laughs> there is but there's also there's also an aspect to this that i think uh darren borrows heavily from too like it's just like darren understands the theatrical presentations he really understands it. i mean there's something that's really genius about darren brown you know that that no one quite ever could figure out why he is so good i mean you have to you kind of sit in awe of the guy right because he's you just know what it is he he knows when to get out of the way right? yeah. yeah he knows when the effect is coming and he knows when to shut up and stop being the guy presenting stuff it's not so much about his ego that he has to be in the spotlight going see what i did he's happy to get out of the way and let the experience or the thing manifest and become what it's going to become so that everyone can experience mystery and real magic because that's the goal it's not about you as the performer. It's about them. It's about what happens when it's over, right? What, what's the story mm -hmm. that they're telling? Because of that moment that was manifest, right? Because of all of us working together to make this thing happen. That's, you know, yeah, he's very skillful. He knows how to get right. out of the way. Richie wanted to know, are they, were they saying Kylo Ren in that last song? <laughs> Just looking at some of these chats. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right, Alf. It was really good. Um, Stephen Felix, Phillips says he summoned a demon. Yeah. That's uh, that's in essence, I think exactly. Uh, Craig says bizarrely reminded me of Bowie. Yes, you're right. You're right. I wonder. I wonder. Maybe he was a big Bowie fan there. It's okay to cross genres. He's right in the think. right in the strike zone. He's right in that age where Bowie would have affected him. I'm sure. I'm sure he did. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you Alf votes for a DB week. That's not mm. David Blaine. That is going to be a Darren Brown week. You know, I vote for Darren, Darren Brown week too. I think we Probably should have do to do like a Darren Brown month or something. I know it's <laughs> so much. Uh, yeah, William Lafay wants it. to know where can I go to understand, understand the principle of these type tricks? Well, good question. So what you're talking about is a giant genre of magic, which, you know, if you're, if you're a beginner in magic or you're only doing close up, we're talking about, uh, mainly big big stage illusions and and how they work uh, and a lot of that um, can be found in very simple uh, a couple of very simple books. In fact, I believe Tarbell even touches on the uh, some of it. Yeah, yeah, some of it. Yeah, yeah. even Mark this Wilson is, touches on some of the principles. Mm -hmm. This is probably this is a really great book. This is uh, Big Book of Magic by Patrick Page. Are those even available anymore? No, this is good. It's a hard, it's a tough find, I would imagine. Do you remember that book? I've had this book for a lifetime, but there's some great illusions, some entry level like the Dollhouse and Vanishing Car. Uh, Do you remember that book though that had the blueprints and it was two volumes? One was like all the pictures of how the Osborne. thing looked. The uh, no, not the Osborne one. It's the uh, it's before that. It's like from the late '70s, early '80s. One's a big giant book. It's a full color book, and then there's the plans, the blueprints that go with it. And it's, you know, if you go and look, if you go find a used book dealer and you ask about illusion plans, you'll oh, yeah. find your way into that. But you'll see that it's a big world and you're going to pay for these secrets because you're basically buying plans from a person that invented a secret with the hopes that someone's going to build the thing. So plans aren't cheap. You might find, 
you, more luck buying books where it's a collection I, of illusions if you're just trying to understand principles. I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm fascinated That's by it. it. The great illusions of magic. That's it. Yeah. Good work, Stephen. I uh, I had a small illusion show for a while, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's not that great. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of humping furniture. Sure. You know. Yep. You I need mean, a truck. You need a trailer. Scott, Scott Alexander, he's been on the show. He's been on yeah. CC a few times and he's told us about it. It's a lot. It's, it's a lot you're basically work. like a traveling rock band, right? But without the band, it's you and a couple of stage mm -hmm. hands and you're moving a lot of gear on and off the stage. And, and I've assisted big illusion acts like this. Right. You know, I'm going to I'm gonna go find this book. I think you need to see. Hey, just stretch for a minute. Okay. Yeah. 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 But I can remember you, getting there. Like, Do you remember who wrote those, Stephen? Do you know who wrote The Great Illusions of Magic? Do you know what the, the author's name on those are? Because those books, those were the best ones I had seen. Because I, you know, I, I'm I'm peripherally interested in illusions. In that, I think that some of those principles can cross over and be great for close-up magic. Byron G. Wells, that's the one. Yeah, those books are cool. Yeah. Uh, I remember spending time with them. I had a friend that had those that set of books, and I remember spending like a month. He let me borrow them and just going through them and just sort of absorbing principles, just understanding how those things worked, and you know the sight lines and the illusions of why those actual giant things with wheels on them actually do what they do is it's, it's, it's a fascinating ride. Uh, but unfortunately those books aren't available anymore. So you'll have to hunt them down. Uh, but you know, William, if you're looking for it, that's, that's going to be the best answer is to find some of those illusion books and then watch a lot of illusions, you know, watch a lot of David Copperfield and watch a lot of uh, Doug Henning because that's sort of the predecessor to David Copperfield. You can see a lot of those, principles in action with clunkier apparatus and then you see a guy like david copperfield has really slim line and sleek apparatus using those same principles you'll get you'll get the gist of what's happening with a lot of these things but watch right just watch a bunch of them and you'll you'll start so to interesting that was the time right when i grew up it was doug henning and david copperfield dueling television specials you know like first there would be a henning and then a copperfield like six months later it was like you know and that sure. was really like, as a kid growing up, that was, you know, what we were really into. And I, I think, you know, this is a very fascinating area of magic that interestingly enough, I believe has really been eclipsed by, you know, more of a stand up type of magic. Well, it's going to come For back. now. It'll come, come, come back. back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It'll come back. Everything's cyclical. Everything yeah. comes back. I couldn't find the book, but I, there's this really great book by maybe Gary Darwin, maybe. Uh, oh, that, yeah. That's a great uh, book, too. There and, you go. And it, it basically is just all about the table, right? So it's like if, if you want to have an illusion show and only carry around one prop. And so he talks about all the various ways you can use it. Uh, it's pretty uh, genius. I think it's Gary Darwin. I'll have to look it up. But it's one of my favorite books on illusions because it's like you can build all the stuff in your garage, really, from card paper cardboard and and you know you'd need some wood but basically you could make a whole uh would be it'd be a little bit low budget but you know <laughs> yeah but a little bit of paint you get some nice tape you could probably dress those things up pretty nice that if you weren't within five feet of them you wouldn't know you know get some good tape yeah yeah you know, like, get some good get good Eddie, gaffer tape Eddie Van gaffer Henry. tape is got you can rule the world with gaffer tape you could <laughs> fix anything so he does roll on hand all the time. So <laughs> back to Simon Drake for a second. So he doesn't just always rely on, and this is what's so great about him, just like Copperfield, you know, like Copperfield would take these moments where he'd come and do a great coin trick or a great card trick. Um, and Simon Drake has the same thing. Like he wants to, he wants to keep it in his genre, but he still isn't afraid to sit down and have these nice, really nice like moments with the audience as we've seen. So let's watch another one. This is actually probably my favorite. Um, let's check it out. It's pretty Pretty dang cool.
great image, huh? I'm pretty sure this, this is the Steinmeier method, too. It's got to be the safest method that there is, right? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think as long as you keep your teeth closed, uh, yeah. But yeah, that the, that that the reason I love it is because you never see the Steinmeier method like that. That I remember watching Jim Steinmeier lecture in the uh, late '80s, uh, like at Abbott's Magic Get Together, where he did this whole routine and taught it in his in his lecture. And <clears throat> so genius, like the that method is so genius. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's in that beautiful book that he sold us at the summit too. That black book, the uh, Conjuring anthology that everybody got. I'm pretty sure it's in there too. It's, it's great. It's so, it's so cool, so deceptive, and it's got all the things you want from it, right? That classic mm, pulling it out of the mouth with the needles falling. Yeah, so good, man. It's so yeah, tough that, to that the, you know, the moment that just so fools you in that though is that you see. You see exactly, and that was not camera tricks. I mean, that's exactly how it would look, right? He puts the needles in the glass. He pours some wine in there. He drinks it. And you have to ask yourself, where did those needles go? Right? Right, that's the real trick, right? Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's pretty dang sneaky and good. <clears throat> I think it's really good. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, Alf. You're exactly right. Okay. Well, what'd you guys think about that? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty great yeah pretty great all right so uh more simon drake we're gonna look at a little i guess we're gonna go we're gonna flip back to the other side now that i love that needle thing so much but um this is a this is a weird one and i do also love they're so short alex don't you love how yeah. they're all two minutes yeah. totally. totally yeah yeah all we're right we're in the home stretch here yeah we are all right here we go so weird <laughs> he's just trying to do his card manipulations and all the <laughs> totally I mean you always want it when you can just card manipulate Wait, you'll have to say that again. I didn't hear you. What? You're on mute, Steve. Sorry. Sorry, man. I said, haven't you always dreamed of your minions come running to watch your card manipulation? <laughs> yeah. It felt like they were done with this card manipulations, though. They're yeah, that, I noticed box. that now. Yeah, they're like, shove this guy in a box. <laughs> Enough of the card tricks. Throw the card in your chin. <laughs> That's a great Halloween trick. <laughs> that one was just ripe for the runaround, you know. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that one at all. <laughs> 
<laughs> hey adam that last one is just a little laugh that they use to finish the show off it's it's only like 20 seconds long it's nothing to it but it's it's totally worth just throwing in there right after this <laughs> okay okay so we so we have seen uh we have seen that this idea of the transposition right the magician gets in trouble on stage locked in some type of apparatus, vanishes and instantly reappears somewhere else we saw copperfield do it with a motorcycle brilliantly done hoisted up in the air disappears on the motorcycle appears in the audience behind you on a motorcycle so uh you know around the world this has been uh, tried and done in various ways and um and i've never seen it quite done that way i must admit <laughs> <laughs> there was one that's close to it remember the one that doug henning did where he's the hangman or he gets he gets hanged they put him up on the thing they put the noose around his neck and then he's the guy pulling the lever it's very similar to that. And I think that's like a classic old classic illusion, right? It's sort of a, just a twist on that premise. Yeah, there's educational play, right? There's a bunch of those with what they call the run around. You know, you got to run around. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, I remember going to see Copperfield at the Fox Theater here in like maybe 99, 90, maybe 2000. And there was a box on top of the chair right next to me, you know, and I was like, oh, I wonder what that's all about. Chair must be broken. You know, meanwhile, I'm so like, I'm supposed to be in the theater, right? And I noticed the glow tape all around it. I should know that's so someone can stand on it, right? Someone, like, someone can yeah. see in the dark, right? And then all of a sudden, it's like the thing's going on on stage. You know, they have all your attention there. Like, literally, I, Copperfield ends up standing on the thing right next to me. And I didn't see it. <laughs> Did he say, totally it? Shh. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't look at you. Don't go, tell anyone. <laughs> It was amazing, you know, and the fans came on too, just in case you're aware. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right about that. Uh, uh, Newell says things that go bump in the night. Yeah, that's a great. Yep, that's, that's it. Classic Henning right there. Classic. We should, do, we should do 70s magic. The problem with all that Henning stuff is that most of the footage hasn't survived. It's all so grainy and, and glitchy that it's not yeah. worth pulling up. It's more painful to watch than it is to, you know, you're not going to get as much enjoyment out of the magic as we are oh, with this. It stinks. It does stink. Yeah. I was like, Henning was really a big deal. It's the first magic I saw on TV, totally. I'm sure it is for a lot of people, you know? I still remember the first effect I saw. Uh, I still remember the, I mean, it, 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 it burned itself, it ingrained itself in my memory so heavily, it's probably why I became a magician. I remember the moment I was only four years old and I remember Doug Henning on TV turning a, a, a handkerchief into a, into a live bird in his hand, you know? And I remember that so vividly, like I was just like, you know, I had found real, I had found like, this is, I'm only That's four. how you found your way to bird magic. It was the first trick you saw. There it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there it was imprinted on you. It yeah. really did. Like it was strongly imprinted. Yeah, like I was like, that guy's a god. A lot of people could argue the first trick you ever saw was a cigarette trick. But, yeah. But you know, and but apparently not. It was the bird magic. I did have a I did have a nice cigarette act for a while uh, back in the uh, late sixties. <laughs> in the late sixties, <laughs> do the supper club circuit in utero. Yeah, you know, couldn't find a good tuxedo with a big enough bow tie. That's right. <laughs> the ruffles on my shirt prevented the tie from tying. Yes. You know, move. you know, it's weird to think about, but as much as Doug Henning was a product of the '70s or, or the late '60s and the '70s, right? David Copperfield was a product of the '80s. And, sure. and when he got 90s. cool. When well, he yeah, he's a, he's around with Henning at the same time. Henning left. We're all talking about Henning instead of Drake, but Henning left to go find his uh he was in a transcendental meditation and, and, and all that stuff and he just guru. left to go find a maharaji or something and yeah, left magic and then copperfield just carried on well and copperfield did a style change right because when he was yeah. competing with doug henning he was competing with him at you know in the 70s and the early 80s and copperfield was not as cool i mean he had some cool aspects to what he was doing but it wasn't until he changed his image Mm -hmm. And sort of looked more like a pop star. And when he changed and looked more like a pop star, then that's when he became like international famous and like sell out shows everywhere, you know. And Before Steinmeier that, too. Little, yeah. Well, that Statue of Liberty thing doesn't hurt. <laughs> mm. Well, I mm. think really it was the jet. Wasn't Steinmeier the jet too? 
Yeah, was, but I think it was the the Statue of Liberty is what made him international famous. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. God, what a smart idea! Like, just that. What a brilliant. I mean, we're talking about a time with no internet, and you you know you had to do something really great to get the kind of coverage that Copperfield needed to to rise to the to become the star that he became. And the idea to vanish the Statue of Liberty could not be any more historic and American and just like it stood for everything and he just nailed it. Like whoever thought of that idea, whoever, I don't know who actually yeah. thought of that idea. Well, gosh, we had the opportunity to find out all the info and nobody asked. Right. <laughs> you know, but let's, cause when you, when you sit and talk with Steinmeier, you actually want to talk about, you know, Robert Stop. Ben and yeah. you know, you yeah. want to talk about the, the guys way back when, cause he knows about all of them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Copperfield's sort of the last one on the list that you want to talk about when you get to sit with that guy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And we have so yeah. much, I mean, Copperfield, like, like we have so much footage of Copperfield, you know? It's the things we can't see, right? Like, I, right. I can't find that trick. I cannot find anywhere that trick that I saw Doug Henning do. Uh, I'm, I know it exists. I haven't seen it since I was a child. It might not even be what Someone I out there somewhere has those Doug Henning specials in a preserved fashion where they digitize those things before the videotape disintegrated. You know what I mean? They have to exist somewhere. So eventually they'll pop up. Eventually we'll be able to see that stuff. And when I come across it, I'll, you know, I'll let you know, because let's, let's find it. Let's find that. I mean, that's like finding the source code, right? We should find like all those original inspirations that turned us on because you know, looking at it with your, your eyes today, it's going to tell a different story and probably inform your mind of what really happened to you back then. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to look for that stuff. So, uh, yeah, don't give up. <laughs> All right, guys. So Simon Drake wants to say goodbye. Let's uh, let him say goodbye to us. Are we done with him? Oh. I, I think the minions are done with him. <laughs> oh, my. See you later. <laughs> That's awesome. And that's the end of volume one. That is so great. <laughs> what a great way to end the show. Bravo. Bravo. Nice. Oh. Good introduction to Simon Drake. Wow. I I know a lot of you guys didn't know who he was or what he did, but that is him right there. We're going to do a little bit more on him later on, I think. Uh, thanks for joining us, guys. Afternoon Astonishment. Do us a favor. Hit like on this video and hit subscribe to our channel. That lets everybody know we're doing a good job with these videos. And while you're at it, go ahead and uh, join Conjure Community, the world's greatest magic club. Thanks for joining us for Afternoon Astonishment. We will see you guys on Thursday, just a short.